Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined by James Dow, who is Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Steele Center for the Study of Religion and Philosophy at Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. James, thank you so much for joining me. Awesome to be with you, Brandon. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. So we're talking about uh, your article, Nature Aesthetics, which came out in Philosophy Compass last year, uh, 2022. And in the paper, you give a survey of sort of the main views uh, historically in uh, nature aesthetics, right? Um, you know, yeah. the appreciation and experience of the natural environment. Uh, and by the end of the paper, you advanced your own view of nature aesthetics, which we'll get to, but I just want to start with some of the history of nature aesthetics, which really tracks the history of aesthetics as a subfield in philosophy, right? That, you know, early on in aesthetics with Edmund Burke and Kant, the paradigm of aesthetic experience is the experience of nature right? The experience of art is sort of the second or maybe even third class uh, sort of aesthetic experience. You know, you experience beauty in the sublime by going out into nature. But then when we shift into the 19th century with Hegel and others, right? Um, nature gets demoted, right? If not outright ignored uh, in philosophical literature having to do with um, uh, 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 aesthetics, right? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. there are some exceptions, like the transcendentalists, um, uh, with you know uh, uh, Thoreau and um, the other dude whose name I just blanked on, which is embarrassing. Emerson. 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 Jesus Christ. Right. Thank you. Uh, or <laughs> you know Leopold or John Muir, right? There, there's mm -hmm. some of that, but it, it largely is absent. And then in the 20th century, we get this development where, okay. Uh, the experience of nature is becoming more and more central to the study of aesthetics, but the views are largely cognitivist in nature, right? Mm -hmm. Where in order to properly appreciate a natural object or a natural environment, you need to apply scientific categories, right? That you yeah. need to know what type of insect it is or what type of tree it is uh, in order to properly appreciate, right? Under the correct category. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I guess just to start off, I would just like to invite you to talk about some of that history, and then eventually we'll get into your view. Great. So thanks. That's a great place to start. Um, yeah, you're right that Burke and Kant are thinking about they using natural examples pretty often when they're talking about beauty and the sublime. Um, and one of the other things that they're also talking about is ethics, right? So they're also talking about relations with others and ethical relations with others involving some kind of aesthetic sensibility as, as well. So it's not only nature aesthetics that gets left out. It's also, you know, um, forms of uh, moral sensibility that involve aesthetic appreciation. Uh, so I, I think that's also important to recognize. And I think too, we should say, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I think in contemporary aesthetics, as it's taught, uh, nature aesthetics is not often brought up right i mean i think in the in the american society for aesthetics very often when they sort of ask people what their areas are it's mostly do you do are you interested in visual art or music or film or right and the list sometimes includes nature but or environment but often doesn't right so i think we're still in the position of nature aesthetics being um, not as central in aesthetics as it might have been my, I guess my way of thinking about why that happens um, is partly, as you mentioned, Hegel. So I think Hegel is thinking about um, uh, aesthetics in terms of something that expresses the freedom of human creativity, right? Or the freedom of, of you know, uh, making something out of nature and turning it into something, you know, uh, that participates in absolute spirit, right? So for... For Hegel, it, it really is about human freedom, and that becomes a way of framing what it is that uh, counts as beautiful. And that's really interesting, not just in the context of Burke and Kant, but also like Hegel's immediate predecessors in friends, right? 
uh, people who in the romantic period in Germany were also using aesthetic appreciation to talk about nature, art, you know, ethics, political concerns even, right? So yeah, I mean, I think you're right too, later on in the late, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, as people are writing textbooks, right? Um, those anthologies and textbooks that are put together on aesthetics are almost all philosophy of art, right? I think too, there's um, there's also a shift in art too, that, you know, in, in, um, in the context of the emergence of conceptual art or Dadaism or ready-mades or in the context of, think you know art that was reflecting on what art was it it's also becomes more uh, aesthetics becomes more concerned with those ontological questions what counts as art and not and that that does lead to an emphasis on art rather than rather than on nature so yeah i mean i think i think it is we are seeing in the late 80s early 90s a reemergence in a sense of nature aesthetics um, that's where I'd locate it. And, and I think it's important to draw on that past history and connect it with, with what people are discussing today. Yeah. Awesome. And so it's interesting that, you know, in the 20th century, the on, uh, ontology of art becomes sort of the dominant issue in the philosophy yeah. of art, right. With, with Danto, et, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. um, at, you know, looking at Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes and thinking, well, mm -hmm. what makes these things art, but not the actual packages that you can buy in the store? Uh, mm -hmm. it, whereas I guess it seems like prima facie obvious what the ontology of nature is. It's just what's ever on the outskirts of town, right? And <laughs> right. yet that that's yeah. clearly a problematic assumption, right? That sort of, I guess, folk right. assumption to make that, oh, it's whatever's out there because those natural spaces are largely curated, right? Or at least involve yep. human intervention. And so, you know, you talk a bit about that in the paper. And so, you know, mm -hmm. what are some of your views on the ontology of nature? Yeah, that's a good place to start. So I think um, in terms of uh, motivating the questions of nature aesthetics, I basically think there are four questions that, are, that we have to start with. One is, what do we mean by a natural environment? So when we're saying we're aesthetically appreciating nature, what do we mean by a natural environment? I call that the ontology question. The next question is, what's relevant, psychologically speaking, to our appreciation of natural environments? So that's sort of like, what is, I call that the psychology question. So what mental states? You know, is it beliefs? Is it knowledge? Is it emotions? Is it imagination? Is it our intentions, our movements? Like, what kinds of, you know, psychological states should give us different types of aesthetic experiences? Um, that's the psychology question. And the third question is how ought we to, or how should we appropriately appreciate the natural world? Are there any constraints on, you know, what norms should govern our aesthetic appreciation with the natural world, focusing on the aesthetic norms? Like, is there aesthetic advice, right? Are there nature aesthetics guides, right? And what would those be? Uh, what norms would govern that? I call that the normative question. Or no, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's called the normative question. And the fourth question, which is uh, sort of the most contemporary question in nature aesthetics, is what's the relationship between nature aesthetics and environmental ethics, right? And that question uh, is basically, well, how do we relate our accounts of environmental value to the beauty and sublimity and scenicness of the natural world? Um, so I take it, so there's those four questions are the kind of pivotal questions that can begin the conversation. Yeah, cool. So what are your views on the ontological question? Well, I think the ontological question is um, some philosophers, like for instance, the scientific cognitivist, and specifically if you're gonna start reading nature aesthetics, you almost always have to start with Alan Carlson. So Alan Carlson is, deeply responsible for the reemergence of nature aesthetics um, and environmental aesthetics in the, in the late 20th century. And his account, scientific cognitivism, his answer to the account, to the question of, of what is a natural environment, mostly focuses on wilderness or wilderness areas, right? Now, we know that wilderness 
as defined by parts of nature that are untrammeled by human beings, right? There's only basically 3% of Earth, 4% of Earth that, that counts, right? We have wilderness areas that technically count as wilderness areas, but they're not true wilderness on a strict definition. Um, I think there's another issue here, which is how do we define what nature is, right? And I think there's lots of conversation about that. Um, and usually when people are talking about how to define nature, they intuitively think something like, like sort of what you mentioned, wherever humans aren't, right? So it's sort of like, there's the natural world and then there's human nature and however we distinguish that, that's what we mean by a natural environment. Um, I think we should sort of change the subject on the, on the ontological question, right? So my own, my own way of changing the subject is to move from thinking about wilderness and trying to define you know, nature in terms of wilderness to thinking about wildness and thinking about a kind of aesthetic property that we're appreciating. So this is sort of influenced by reading some philosophy of nature stuff where people are basically like, well, you know, there's three different accounts of what nature means. You know, we can define nature in terms of um, a contrast between, uh, you know, the natural sciences, whatever physics, chemistry, and biology investigate. That's, that's what's natural and all the other disciplines are not investigating, right? But that seems to be a problematic distinction because, you know, psychologists think about nature, right? The nature of human nature, anthropologists think about nature, philosophers reflect on nature. So it's not as if the natural sciences serves as the best definition. Um, another way is people contrast the natural and the artifactual, right? So we could say, well, when we're going to try to figure out what a natural environment is, it's wherever there aren't tools or shovels or art, right? Wherever there aren't, there is an artifice. Um, but there's also going to be cases where we can have nature experiences where technology or artifacts are involved. And there's also going to be cases where artists are going to, um, you know, have natural experiences in the context of their art, right? So um, you sort of hinted at this before that, you know, there's definitely in the 20th century too, in the 70s, a trend towards environmental art, right? Towards art that is made in order to problematize this sort of like nature art of artifact distinction. So I think the, the third way to go is to think about sometimes we use the term nature as being um, uh, outside of human control or outside of, of ways that we can um, use our agency to change or to control, right? So we can definitely think about nature in those terms, in terms of, yeah, our concepts sort of are, you know, it's difficult to use our concepts or our language to capture this feature of the natural world, right? So that's what I call wildness. Wildness is that feature of the natural environment, which seems or appears to be like outside of our control, right? And that can be a way of talking about the ontological question while still like changing the subject away from those other ways. Yeah, right. And so you mentioned like, natural areas that have been preserved by humans right like wilderness preserves right where yeah. you know there there are lots of trees the animals are still there by and large and mm -hmm. you know they're not mowing right they're not trimming hedges yeah. there's just you know some paths that maybe you can hike on um mm -hmm. does that count as wild in your definition right because it does seem to be a space that's largely under human control yeah, I think I, I'd like to focus on um, those aspects of nature that have movements that are difficult for us to perceive as being under our control, right? So one way to think about this is just let's talk about some experiences. So um, we can begin with a creek, right? And the flowing of a creek. As you're experiencing the flowing of a creek uh, or, or a, you know, a river, you can experience uh, its power sometimes sort of in ways that don't really appreciate it, right? So if you go canoeing on a river, it looks all gentle and calm. 
and then you fall out of the canoe and you get pinned between the canoe and a tree and you have this experience of the power of the water that actually is different than what you might assume by looking at the surface of it, right? So there's this sense of the, um, we make assumptions about how we're perceiving features of the natural world. And then once we're embedded in them, or once we're engaging with them, we realize that the power sort of outstrips us in, in these deep ways. Um, if you, you can spend time looking at the movement of tree limbs and then try to experience that movement yourself and recognize that the way that the tree is responding to the wind is foreign or strange or different or un unusual to the way that you respond to the wind. And that sense of it being, you know, uh, there being a kind of um, difference in your own experience, right? Um, another experience I've had is while I was running in the woods, experiencing a, um, a few deer running down this path that I was running, they're crossing my path and the kind of movement they were, uh, they were engaging in was something that I was, I was trying to understand how fast I would have to run or, you know, what I would have to do in order to run as quickly and as agile, you know, with such agility as they were moving. And I couldn't process that. Right. So there's this, it's not like control as in like intervening and manipulating the environment. It's an experiential difference, right? Of not being able to in, in our own movements and our awareness of our own body, uh, experience the sort of wildness of the movement of the natural world. Yeah. Right. And that reminds me that, you know, so in our backyard, we have, you know, planting beds where we have lots of flowers that we've planted and we specifically chose flowers that attract pollinators, right? And so right. you can sit in our backyard and watch dozens, if not hundreds of bees and butterflies uh, and other insects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hummingbirds also, you know, show up for yeah. these things and you know, mm -hmm. the way they move and the sounds they make, right, are in a sense mm -hmm. outside of our control. And so it's interesting in terms of, you know, appreciating these non-human things. Um, and and even, you know, recently, semi-related to that, uh, we've had cicadas, you know, come oh, up. Oh, nice. And yeah. the sound is just deafening. Right. <laughs> right. And so, yeah. you know, you're hearing these things communicating with one another, but there's a sense in which, I don't understand what it is that they're saying other than presumably they're trying to attract mates or something. They are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have, uh, I went on a, I did a race. I, I run ultras uh, and I was running in the woods here in Arkansas one summer and uh, it was a 50 K run and the entire run at night uh, started at like seven and went to two in the morning. And, um, and it was, there were cicadas all through the forest and it was like, the sound was so overwhelming that I couldn't otherwise look around or like pay attention to other things. I mean, it wasn't just deafening. It was like being surrounded by this, you know? Um, yeah. So, so I think that's, that's important too. You know, I mean, I think we, we do tend to um, impose kind of ways of thinking about natural sounds in terms of musical sounds or in terms of, sort of everyday artifactual experiences that we have. And it's important for us to like be available to those experiences that contest that or challenge that, right? Put it, put that into question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess the quick answer is I would like to trade the kind of ontology of wilderness for the aesthetics of wildness, right? And I think if we shift towards wildness, then we're going to see too that this is important for our understanding of um, our own intervention, right? In small scales and in larger scales too, right? So I think it's deeply important in the context of agriculture and in gardening. Um, uh, I think in, in the context of gardening, you learn a lot about, um, you know, sometimes leaving things out of your control means, you know, uh, food is produced and sometimes you end up with weeds, right? And that's a deep lesson, you know, like that kind of interaction, uh, trying to figure out how to cooperate with the natural world is uh, it's better for us to think about wildness. And I mean, just you, we mentioned the history before. Um, there's there are cases where John Muir and 
and Thoreau and Leopold are talking about wilderness, but there's actually lots of other cases where wildness is the focus, right? And they're explicit about their concern with, um, you know, the agency of the natural world being, um, having capacities that we don't have, right? That are more powerful than us, teach us lessons, enable us to transform our perception, you know, um, give us, you know, aha moments, moments of awe, moments of uh, inspiration, whatever it might be. Yeah, right. right. And it's not like Thoreau was like in the middle of nowhere, right? He's like in right. basically, uh, you know, like a subdivision, <laughs> not yeah. too far from Boston, <laughs> right? And no, yet no. he's still capable of having all of these, you know, really deep and important uh, aesthetic experiences with, yeah. you know, nature or with the wild as you're discussing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, when people think about Leopold, a lot of his experiences are actually in, on his own farm, right? So the Sand County Almanac is, is an account of the Sand County broadly, but it's actually mostly experiences of his own farm. So there's a sense in which too, like we tend to think something like your farm or your you know property can't count as nature, but it's it, there are these important intersections that teach us about cooperation, right? Teach us about the cooperation between humans and nature. And I think wildness is an important thing to, to shift towards and to think about. And yeah, it yeah. really does, it does mean then that actually nature aesthetics um, is different from our aesthetics, right? In an important way. And so far, I mean, I know too, in the, in the kind of more recent history of um, the aesthetics of art, ontology is less important i guess or you know it's kind of being deprivileged in a sense um but but i mean i i think i think that's important in the context of nature aesthetics yeah awesome and so maybe we should shift to the psychological and normative questions right and, sure. and yeah. through talking about exactly what you mentioned right or at least something related to it which is you know how is appreciating nature aesthetically different than appreciating art aesthetically or how are they similar right that what do we right. get from nature that we can't get from art and maybe vice versa yeah yeah so i think a key um starting place would be thinking about um what so there's an argument that uh, carlson presents which is basically there has to be uh, some disanalogy between the appreciation of art and the appreciation of the natural world um, generally when we're appreciating art, we're looking at an object or we're looking at something that is, uh, you know, we're focusing on or having our attention, um, to, you know, something in front of us. Right. Um, but in environmental aesthetics or in nature aesthetics, it's more of a field or more of a broad or something broader. Right. So in the context of, you know, you can take, uh, piece of driftwood and take it from the, the ocean and put it on your mantle and appreciate it as a work of art, but really to truly appreciate it as being, you know, a natural environment, it's best to leave it in the environment and appreciate its role and its connection with other things. Right. So there's a sense in which uh, some people call this the ambient, right. Or they call it, um, you know, the uh, appreciation in a field or appreciation of, something that's environmental, truly environmental appreciation, right? Um, so that's definitely important as a first step is seeing that holistic appreciation is required in the context of natural environments. And that may be a first way to distinguish it. Another way too is um, there are definitely lenses through which we appreciate art as artifacts that we have to shed, right? So one way to begin to talk about this would be, we tend to think of nature uh, through the conception of kind of scenic snapshots. So our aesthetic experience of, you know, the natural world presupposes that people have cameras and they're gonna, you know, you drive along the highway in the Rockies and or in the Ozark Mountains where I am or whatever, and it'll say scenic viewpoint, right? And you come to the scenic viewpoint and this scenic viewpoint is to be photographed, right? So there's a sense in which like there's a way of appreciating the natural world, not as nature, but as artifactual, which is using the kind of framing of different kinds of uh, 
you know, like the appreciation of art, in this case, photography, right? Where you're to frame it in a particular way. And, you know, John, John Muir's uh, um, article on the High Sierra sort of discusses this, sort of mocks it, right? He's, he tells a story of going into the um, High Sierra and with some artists that are trying to find the best place to make a landscape painting, right? And, and he drops them off to make, he's like, this is a great place, right? He shows them a lot of places and they're like, this won't work, this won't work. Okay, here's a fine scenic viewpoint right which and he drops them off and then he goes and hikes this this peak for the first time when no one ever has done it and almost dies and has these amazing transformative experiences and then a storm comes through he goes back and picks up the artists and and um you know they're they're like afraid for their life and you know he's like i had an awesome time i don't know about you and right so the idea is that there's this his the moral of the story is that Mira thinks he's truly appreciating the natural world because he's going out in it and engaging with it and being transformed by it. But you know, to appreciate it from the scenic viewpoint is me is mediated by artifact or artifice, right? And that's a sort of that's a sort of first step. Yeah, that's interesting, right? And and you know, so there's like the postcard view of environmental or natural appreciation. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, that, you know, as you were talking, I was reminded of going into museums and what you see in museums is a lot of people, they don't really look at the paintings. Mm -hmm. They sort of look at it, turn around, hold their phone up, get the selfie with yeah. uh, the Van Gogh or the Picasso or whatever. And yeah. similarly, right, you know, you people go to, you know, rock and pop concerts, et cetera. And this is how mm -hmm. they're looking at the concert. Or like <laughs> right, this, totally. right, because yeah. they're filming what they are seeing to watch it later. And it's interesting that yeah. sort of the postcard view of nature appreciation makes its way into art spaces as well in a way Absolutely. that, you know, I yeah. think what we would probably want to say is that these people aren't properly experiencing the concert or, you know, the painting right. or the sculpture or whatever, because it's mediated yeah. by like technology and you know, this desire to, you know, post the pic for others to see, to show that I was there when, yeah, you saw the thing, but were you yeah. there appreciating it, absorbed in it, in the way that, yeah. you know, leads to a deeper and more transformative sort of aesthetic experience, less superficial? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it can be, it can be even more subtle than that. So in the case of, uh, I, I, I go to the MoMA, uh, in the winter time each year, and there's a painting by Andrew Wyeth called Christina's World, and where, I'm not sure if it's still there at the MoMA, but where it's placed is at the top of a staircase. Yeah. So people are basically like walking down the staircase to go to the bottom floor, and they often, you know, in our experience, we're when we're walking towards a staircase, we're not going to like look around; we're just walking the staircase. But this painting sits like right there, and it's a wonderful painting uh, for all sorts of reasons. So. I often just stop people and stand there and just wait for someone to come by and, you know, talk to them and just keep talking to them. Right. And, and they're always like, um, thank you for standing here and asking me to appreciate this. Cause I would have just walked right by, you know? So I think it's that kind of um, being able to step out of our usual kind of natural attitudes or habitual attitudes to be available to it. So I think that's the first the first pass is, you know, thinking about um, how it is that aesth the aesthetic appreciation of nature calls for a different kind of appreciation, right? Um, I think too, you know, this this is um, an, on the other side. You know, some people have argued that the aesthetic appreciation of nature is distinctive from art because it's completely free, or completely relative to perceivers or it's, you know, an anything goes affair, right? So I think there is this tendency too to sort of, you know, presuppose that in the art case, um, you know, there are art historians, there are art theorists, there are, there are, you know, docents, there are people who are going to tell you what you should or shouldn't appreciate. And there'll be aesthetic guidance in those cases, same deal with music, you know, you read a pitch fork review, you know what album to listen to or whatever. Um, but in the case of nature, it's just sort of an anything goes affair, right? Um, 
it's it's there there are no rules or there there is no constraint right so i think that's a that's an also an important place to start too is to ask well when we are engaging with the natural environment do we suppose that there should be some kind of constraint right is there some kind of aesthetic guidance uh out there about how we how we should appreciate the beauty or sublimity of nature and is there <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. do you think there is yeah i mean i think i think there's definitely um there's definitely changes that are possible by adopting different kinds of psychological states and i think that's what's important right so one thing we should talk about too is you know there's there's sort of um there's a bunch of different views out there but generally we can categorize the views of nature aesthetics in terms of broadly cognitive views, right? Cognitive views presuppose that the guidance that we're gonna get about what kinds of structures go into our appreciation would be things like knowledge, you know, knowledge of the natural world, beliefs about the natural world, thoughts, categories, categories that structure, you know, um, whatever we're looking at, an animal, you know, knowing that it's a hawk, knowing that this is a, you know, a pin oak, knowing that we're looking at, you know, a particular kind of fig tree or whatever, right? So cognivism generally holds this view that, that um, in order to appreciate the natural world, you have to have some kind of knowledge, you have to have beliefs, you have to have some kind of cognitive content, like the scientific categories. Um, another branch of that is more concerned with everyday categories, like, you know, stories that people tell about the natural world, the uh, stories about nature and the world's religions, you know, or just narratives you hear from your parents when they, you know, read you uh, The Giving Tree, for instance, right? Uh, which uh, Shel Silverstein book I was read way too much. Uh, but that that's a kind of cognitivist view. And then there's another group of views which we might call non-cognitive, right? And they argue that that knowledge, beliefs, you know, cognition, not required. It's not required to have um, uh, any kind of concepts in order to appreciate the natural world. That we can appreciate the natural world simply through moving around in it, exploring it, discovering features of it, having different kinds of emotions, emotions of awe or wonder or you know grandeur or whatever it might be um and sometimes specifically mystery or you know the sense of um uh, respect for the power of nature or the, the magnitude of nature right so i think it's important to like make that distinction that there are groups of views that are more cognitive and require knowledge and then others that are more non-cognitive and uh don't yeah, and which do you lean toward, right? I mean, so the, your view, you mm -hmm. call it enacting nature's value, right? This is the view yeah. that you sketch in advance in, in the article. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. which are you leaning toward more, the cognivist, more to the non-cognivist, or are you like this third thing that's distinct? I am trying to, two? I'm trying to motivate a third thing. So yeah. I consider my enacting nature's value view to be, um, I do think, that there is some kind of intellectual uh, capacity that's required, right? But I don't think that it's uh, propositional knowledge. I think it's skill or competence, right? So I think there are competencies, there's nature aesthetics competencies, and those involve passing from perception to different kinds of other, you know, experiences that we might have. and those skills as a form of aesthetic agency is it counts as a, a requirement right like there is a there is something that's necessary you don't just have a passive response to the natural world and and adequately aesthetically appreciate it you have to try and you know intend to do different things and change the way you're perceiving and the way you're sensing so i I um I agree with the cognivist that there should be some conditions upon the aesthetic appreciation of the natural world. I just disagree that it has to be categories or conceptual content or you know something cognitive in that sense. It doesn't have to be propositional. 
And I think mostly my worry about it being propositional is that often that takes us away from our natural experience, right? So if you're, you know, you're in South Dakota in a creek and you're panning for gold and you're experiencing, you know, different kinds of colors emerging from the water underneath the water as you're panning for gold, let's say, um, that can be an experience that you are get distracted by by thinking about the chemical composition of gold or thinking about certain features of the natural world that might not be totally relevant to your perception. So I think, I think sometimes scientific categories um, help, but most a lot of times it's going to distract us from from our perception. On the other side, the non-cognitive view that I am most influenced by is uh, Arnold Berlian's engagement view. Um, so his view is that we should focus on our bodily engagement with the natural world. And for him, that's really, I mean, his methodology is mostly like a blend of uh, phenomenology and pragmatism. So he's sort of influenced by uh, Merleau-Ponty and by John Dewey. And his focus is on an experience of the natural world that involves engagement. And engagement is... Um, involves like attention, particular kind of attention to the body and to the sensuous experiences of the body. And also a type of recognition of affects, different kinds of emotions that change because of that awareness of the body. And then also importantly, um, an attempt to immerse yourself in or flow with the natural world. So I think, I think my view is closest to Berlin's, um, but I think his focus on the body and on sensations of the body doesn't enable us to uh, grasp how appreciating nature as nature is important, right? So I think um, focusing more on agency and not just on our agency, but on agency itself and wildness enables us to do some, uh, you know, it's a co non-cognitive view in the sense that involves sensation and perception but it's not focused on the sensuousness of our body as much as the relationship between types of movements that we do and types of movements that exist in the natural world. Yeah, so it, it I'm seems, taking a bit from that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it seems like brilliance view could be equally applied to urban environments, right? Like how you move yeah. through the city, how you take it in being struck by, you know, graffiti or street art or, you know, absolutely. Uh, you know, urban ruin or something of that sort, right? It, it mm -hmm. seems, and so, you know, yeah, you're having an experience of an environment, but it's not an experience of a natural environment. And so it's not, yeah. it doesn't seem to be capturing what it is, to, as you said, to experience nature as nature. Yeah, I mean, in in the, uh, in the article, I outline like a few different desiderata for an account of nature aesthetics. And the one that Berlian does really well at and really has as his goal is the notion of a unified aesthetic. So Berlian thinks that when we're engaging with nature aesthetics, we need to find a way to articulate an account, which is going to also be able to be applied to, um, you know, urban environments, but then also to art and to politics and to an experience of love or whatever. Right. So he does think and, and basically he thinks that focusing on the body and phenomenology of the body will enable that universal aesthetic, right? So, and yeah, a lot of uh, people who argue against him, especially Alan Carlson say he doesn't capture the nature as nature view, it's too subjective. He also doesn't, there's no way to make sense of his account as being objective, um, which might be desirable for other reasons like connecting to environmentalism or convincing you know uh, environmental policy folks or politicians economists whatever value nature differently so yeah i mean i think while he does uh he's aiming to get the unified aesthetic goal met but he's otherwise struggling with other cases and i think that's true of many of the views yeah, yeah and i guess you know related to that is you know if, if you're being influenced by merlo ponty and dewey you shouldn't sh focus on the subjective, you should really focus on the intersubjective, right, of doing right. this with other people. And I know you've yeah. written about yeah. joint attention, right, as oh, I yeah. have, and, you know, like joint mm -hmm. attention to nature, being there with others seems more uh, transformative and maybe important than 
doing this thing by ourselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was, uh, I think, I think this is an issue in Berlin, and it's an issue in the way that we cast phenomenology. Because I think one of the issues is that you know, in Husserl, intersubjective corroboration is like pivotal to the method, right? And in you know, Marilyn Ponty's phenomenology of perception, it's almost like he's presupposing that social cultural like structures are already influencing our perception and you know i I think it's partly you know the history of uh, psychology being individualist we we tend to um like i think the phenomenologists were presupposing it was social right and when we tell the story of it it's sort of like oh well there's all these features of phenomenology like intentionality for instance and then here's this last chapter on the social, right? And it's not actually like that. It's not that it's like an additional thing added off at the end. It's it's part of the structure of our experience. Now, I mean, I also think too that there's some some parts of my view, um, the enacting nature's value view. I've often wondered: is it harder to um, appreciate wildness or to appreciate? certain changes that are possible through changes in your bodily movement perception with other people around right so it i think i think there is a sense and this is a feature of berlin's view where you um you know you can't you can experience flow with others right in a task of playing chess speed chess or something or in a task of cooking together in a kitchen or in a task of dancing for instance, right? But it might be harder to experience flow or immersion with nature when you're also trying to hang out with other people, right? Yeah. So so I think there's, that's not, um, I, I actually haven't made that connection yet. Like I haven't written about that yet, but I'm definitely interested in connecting joint engagement to these kinds of questions um, and posing it in that that way. Right. Yeah. And as you were talking, it reminds me of like going to Yellowstone National Park and it's hard to get away from people. Right. Oh, so right. You're constantly, you know, oh, there's the bear and there's a hundred people taking photographs of it or there's the buffalo right. and a hundred people are taking photographs of it. And it, I guess that relates to, you know, seeing the Mona Lisa, right, where, mm-hmm. you know, it seems impossible to have a genuine um you know, experience yeah. of that painting because the gallery is constantly packed with tourists taking photos, right? Right. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's uh, that's also true in the art context for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the 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 key thing um, with enacting nature's value view is is to ask, well, who has done the work of changing their bodily movements quite a lot? And what kinds of variation and their sensation, their perception, their experiences was disclosed, right? And I think that's where we get into, you know, I mean, I think people do presuppose something like nature guides are valuable for us, right? And some of the time those nature guides can be, you know, just pointing at and categorizing things. But other times they're actually saying, you know, walk around here. It's okay to peel the bark off. Um, you know, go into this cave, uh, do these variety of actions, you know, uh, don't just look last night, there was a super moon, right? Don't just look at the super moon when it's at night, like wake up early because it's still there. Right. Um, and look at the difference in light when the sun is starting to come up versus when it's gone down. And th- these kinds of, you know, differences in our agency are important to the disclosure of differences in our experience. Um, so I do think that's, that is a kind of joint engagement because we're saying there's, there are agents, you know, other people who have, who have appreciated and we're going to go do the same and appreciate it with them. Um, yeah, I mean, I also think too, you know, there's, there's lots to be gained from thinking about dance as a, as an activity, um, and the kinds of movements that are involved in dance as being applicable in the context of my view, uh, thinking about our relationship to nature. So I haven't really said that. I didn't say that in the article and I haven't really outlined that, 
But I think that if we do use an analogy, it's it's dance, you know, it's sort of the experience or the phenomenology of dancing with someone can importantly be um, analogously sort of related to our experience of the natural world. Um, so I think that's that gets to if you need if people need an analogy to move their way from art to nature, that's that's one I would suggest that sort of best captures my view. Yeah, awesome. And I guess, you know, one question, and then I want to segue to talk about, uh, you know, your other job, I guess, as a musician, yeah, uh, yeah. and how this relates. But one question is, you know, you, you said that you're an activist view of uh, nature aesthetics, right? You conceive of, you know, the knowledge is not propositional knowledge, but rather know how. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are skills then involved in appreciating nature aesthetically. And what are some of those skills, right? I think, you know, you touched on, you know, like the kinesthetic, you know, motion through the the space, mm -hmm. paying attention to your body and, and how it's um, engaging with the world around you. Um, mm -hmm. But what are some of the other skills maybe that are engaged in appreciating nature? Yeah, so I think um, one of the ways to think about the inactivism that I'm inspired by is generally in terms of a kind of sensory motor view. So an activism just basically means that perception is like constitutively action oriented, right? So perception isn't passive, it's active and our changes in our bodily movements and our changes in our agency can alter our perceptual experience in important ways. Um, so I guess one of, the, one of the ways to think about the kinds of skills that are involved is just the sorts of uh, bodily movements that might be uh, enable us to change our vision and thinking about how it is that those bodily movements are different from those that would change our audition, would change our um, you know touch, taste, smell, and then also our our experience of the feeling of our bodies. So I think you know there's definitely um, going to be it's definitely going to be uh, bodily movements and kinesthetic change, right? But I think it's also just um, thinking about different times or different spaces, right? So um, importantly, the account that I'm presenting focuses on place as being deeply important, right? So I don't think, I think we should um, be open to the possibility that different places call for different kinds of agency. And so, you know, like there's a difference between taking your compass and walking in the Black Hills of South Dakota, where there's not going to be very much underbrush, you know, and doing the same thing in Arkansas, which is near impossible in some places, right? So there's a sense in which like different places call for different kinds of agency. And it's first saying, well, how is this bioregion? call for a different kind of movement or a different kind of activity. Um, and it's also importantly about different times, right? So I already mentioned seasons or, you know, times of day, but seasons are also important. And um, also, you know, the kind of paths that you take in your life may be repeatable. And so asking yourself, like, how is it that I could come back to this and this experience might be different at the same time? Right. So it's really reflecting on how it is that uh, because perception is sensory motor, the sorts of structures of our motor activity being spatial and temporal, because our bodies are spatial and temporal, how those variations will matter to the kinds of perceptions that are disclosed. So, you know, changing place, changing time, altering those, and that will give you a different kind of uh, experience. All right, cool. Yeah. Awesome. And so in terms of your songwriting, right? And I guess this mm -hmm. is going to relate to more the ethical side of yeah. um, uh, nature, uh, nature, uh, the environment, natural environment. Uh, and so how do you conceive of what you're doing as a singer, songwriter, band member, right? Uh -huh. um, to what you're doing as a philosopher engaging with the aesthetics of the natural world? Yeah, so um, I started out early in life, identifying myself as a musician. I always thought of myself as a musician. I moved to Boston to play music and audition at Berkeley and never did, right? And then got back to school and 
you know, studied English and philosophy and became a philosopher. And I guess a few years ago, I was like, I need to get back into music, play music. Um, and yeah, so I discovered that I could do both and, and it could be a part of my identity that was pivotal. And, and I think one of the things that I, so I'm, I have three projects. One of them is thisness. Uh, thisness is a dark psychedelic, um, post-rock, post-punk band. Uh, we usually, we've released a few albums. We released an album um, in 21 called Threshold. And then we released an EP uh, earlier this year. I don't know, it's 20, was it 22? Yeah, 22. And then we released an album earlier this year, an EP earlier this year. And so in that project, I'm really, um, I'm definitely concerned with sort of uh, changes in the natural world. We can call it environmental weirdness or, um, you know, experiences of the natural world that are sublime. Uh, I often write about that and dream about that. I have different narratives that I've kind of constructed about um, figures struggling with floods, with fires, with hurricanes, with tornadoes, with certain kinds of experiences of uh, extreme features of the natural world. That's definitely been something that like I've thought a lot about in the context of nature aesthetics, the notion of you know sublime experiences, um, but it's also something that I'm drawn to in the context of music. So a lot of the music that inspires me uh, is really approaching the sublime, right? Uh, I'm deeply inspired by like post-rock music, uh, like Explosions in the Sky or Godspeed You Black Emperor, or even I guess Pink Floyd sort of counts, right? Um, if you stretch it a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm deeply inspired by music that itself is, um, loud and bigger than us and overwhelms us and feels sublime. And I take up those ideas in the context of my writing the lyrics, um, think a lot about post-apocalyptic narratives, think a lot about, uh, features of the natural world and sort of liminal or threshold experiences of nature and humans and those things sometimes blending into each other in complex ways but uh those themes often come out come out in the writing yeah right and so that seems to be a theme uh that really connects um you know your role as a songwriter and your role as a philosopher here right as, as you were talking about earlier right you conceive of the wild right as something that outstrips our ordinary categories or scientific categories mm -hmm. also yeah right yeah. and that's what you're describing here is you know what seems to move you as a songwriter is these um experiences that outstrip our ordinary or scientific conceptual categories right the liminal mm -hmm. spaces where it's where where are we this is weird or the yeah. sublime which totally uh, uh overwhelms us right and our ability to right. comprehend what's going on or um you know, music that's just really loud. And so it's immersive. And so the boundary mm -hmm. between self and world, which I guess relates to your experience of the ultra marathon, or I guess the 50K through the woods mm -hmm. and just being utterly moving through sound of cicadas, right? It's, yeah. it's very much like what you seem to be really interested in is precisely mm -hmm. that sense of being overwhelmed or in some way minimized, um, uh, yeah. you know, in the face of the natural world. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely interested in like the experience of nature being bigger than us, being more powerful than us. Um, it being something that's strange or we sort of have a tendency to want to describe it and want to put it into words and want to capture it. But um, we're always in this back and forth between trying to describe it and coming up short. Right. And, but we don't, so, you know, we might have the anxiety of like, oh, we'll never capture this. We won't ever be able to, you know, capture what it's like to drive through a tornado or something. Um, but I think we we have to recognize that we'll always have that tendency. Like that tendency doesn't disappear, right? Like we, and so I think taking different, um, for me, taking different, using different sorts of ways of engaging with it like writing music versus writing about it in philosophy um and 
I think they're sort of similar too. Like, right. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not explicitly talking about philosophy, but often it influences me. Right. I'll use phrases from, <clears throat> you know, phrases that people who read philosophy might know from Wittgenstein or whatever. Right. Um, people can go find it if they're interested, but yeah, there's all sorts of cases where the references I'm making to difference, you know, are really about the because that's just what influences me. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, it's definitely that kind of experience of nature being out of out of control and more complicatedly now nature being something that we have caused to be out of our control right i mean i think that's a paper of mine that i've been working on apart from this uh this paper the nature studies paper is uh i'm trying to make sense of the anthropogenic sublime what i call the anthropogenic sublime which is you know, traditionally, the notion of the sublime involves a distinction between human nature and nature. And so to, to, to begin to describe the sublime experience, you have to say something like nature is beyond, right? Or, you know, it's it, it outstrips our rational capacities or it outstrips our concepts or something like that. Um, but even in the context of agency, there's features of the natural world, you know, a recent hurricane, for instance, that is different, weird, right? In itself is a natural disaster, but also what makes it even weirder is that it's human, partly human caused, right? So if, if you know, if you think about the Anthropocene or you think about anthropogenic effects on, on climate weirdness, on the shifting changes in our, in our global environment, then you can think about how it is that that has to be a part of the experience, right? And so I'm really interested in that as well, how it is that our intervention is troubling to us, right? As a, you know, it's it's beyond us, but it's also something that we can cause or something that we can have influence on, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so on that note, I think we'll end the discussion. Um, I just cool. want to note that, you know, as you know, I'm a fan of thisness. And so I'll definitely mm -hmm. post links to the band in the description for the video. And I'm very much looking forward to the other stuff you're working on coming out yeah. in the future. Um, so James, thank you so much. This was an absolutely fantastic discussion. Well, thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it. Awesome.